Hello, my name is Megs Reynolds, and I am the Executive Director of the Doomer Agriculture Foundation. We are the national voice and champion for mental health and Canadian agriculture. And joining me today is Mona Cooley on our Talk It Out uh, series that we're running. Our focus this month, our theme this month is on bipolar. And Mona, I'll, hold, I'll hand it over to you for you to continue to introduce yourself. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Megs, and thank you for inviting me to talk about this topic that started in our lives in 1995 when our daughter was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And uh, and just a little brief before that is that lots of times there was challenges within our family, and especially between her and I, and that was where the challenges began we were locking horns a lot and but that led to you know uh different things happening with mood swings and different things that she was having she was in in uh you know high school and coming home crying and all of these things were happening so it was quite a we just thought it was a mood swing is that teenage part of the life and everything else we you know, and of course, the pressure of exams and everything else that went with it. But, you know, you didn't know what else there was. And I certainly wasn't aware of mental illness or, as we're talking about today, bipolar disorder. So that's kind of a little quick introduction to what we're likely going to talk about. Thanks, Mona. Yeah, as you were talking, I was thinking, like, how do you differentiate between those teenage years and emotions and you know butting heads and you know I'm thinking of to when I was a teenager to you know the two my two girls who are just nine and seven but I'm seeing that already and how do you know that it's something more than that you don't and at that time you know like mental illness wasn't on the radar in 1995 it just wasn't on the radar and and of course you're not thinking of those things you're just thinking that's you know, part of their growing up and, you know, in the teenage years, there's lots of uh, emotions happening and changes happening in their lives. And, and you're just thinking, oh, it's just those teenage years. And that's how you sloughed it off. But uh, with her, what eventually happened was she was out with friends. They went on a vacation and went hiking. She loved to hike. That was one thing. She's very athletic, went hiking with some friends and her and the two other guys went hiking up into the mountains and some of them stayed back at camp and away they went and they got lost. And they were in up waist high with snow trying to get out and find their way out and it wasn't happening and it got very panicky. And so when they did eventually get out, it was very, it was, uh, it was late in the night. I think it was about two o'clock in the morning or something. It was, and the, so they were the ones back at camp were going to start call, uh, calling in help at that time, but they arrived. And when she came home from that vacation, so she left on the Friday herself, came back a different girl. And so she said, I had a near death experience. And we said, oh, and then she explained it. Well, that week, there were things starting to happen. And a mother's intuition usually knows very quickly that there's something not right. She was on the phone, phoning everybody, phoning her friends, my, our friends, some people we knew back. And she was calling them. And I thought, what is going on? So I just stayed observing is what I did. And then that week, there was different things. She was running around the Glenmore Reservoir in Calgary, which is 18 kilometers twice a day. And staying up night, caught her at night, dancing on the bed. And she was just happy. And I thought, oh, my gosh, she was pacing and everything was going on. And then Sunday night, everything blew apart and she she thought she had the cure for AIDS and her husband now Colin his mom was a nurse and I called her very quickly and she came right over because I didn't know what we were dealing with and and it was very bizarre and so she you know she was uh uh you know wanting to tell us to 
be with her because she had the cure for AIDS and everything. And then she bursted out the door. And our son and two uh, daughters took after her and hauled her down on the front lawn. And we took her to the hospital. And she was diagnosed that night. And that is not common. Wow. A, a bipolar disorder. She was the doctor, you know, they checked her and everything. My biggest fear of taking her to the hospital is her going in calm and there'd be nothing wrong. That was my biggest concern. But she did go in calmly. But of course, as time the doctor worked with her, then they diagnosed her that night. And I thought that was a common thing. And I got told <laughs> later on that that is not common. But she mm -hmm. ticked all the boxes in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which everybody knows. I think most people know that that's what psychiatrists look for to check to see what symptoms are happening. So, so now yeah. looking back and knowing what you do about uh, bipolar disorder, you can say that she was at that very high high and yeah. then came down from that. Yeah, she she would go very high, and that seemed to be what happened was more high, but then she would drop to a depression, and and of course that became a very low point, and that was a very difficult time because then it was a struggle to even exercise or go and do things and things like that, and with that it was making it even harder, but. Um, you know, those ups and downs were the challenge, but she went more to the manic side in most cases when things weren't working or medications weren't working, but, and then went to the depression, but the, it was that up and down uh, was our start of our journey and had what was mental illness, what was bipolar disorder. I had no clue what this was all about, but I also remember something about my I'm adopted but I had connection with my biological dad and uh, they said something about mental illness or there was something my, my grandma was crazy and that's what I heard I thought that didn't seem right who would call anybody crazy but I think at that time they were they were you know, that was something. Didn't know what it was, yeah. Didn't know what it was, and it was bizarre, but there is mental illness on my biological dad's side. What was, like, I mean, that her getting her diagnosis so quick, what was that like for you, um, especially coming from a place where, like you said, you didn't really know about mental health or, or anything to do with it at that point? Megs, we were very fortunate. Uh, if I can say that right now, and somebody's going to say, what? How can you be fortunate? She was in her third year nursing. So she was 22 years old at the time that this happened. And we had to make sure that she had completed her, her year studies in her third year nursing. So I phoned up to the university and talked to a professor there and, and checked and everything else. And I told her at that time, I says, uh, the reason I'm checking is, we wanted to make sure her classes were done. She She's in the hospital and she got diagnosed with bipolar disorder last night. She said, really? And I said, yes, really. I have no idea what this means. I don't even know what it, I got a little idea now what it, it can be and what's ahead of us a little bit, but there wasn't much. So she put me in touch with a gal at uh, Canadian Mental Health Association because her herself is bipolar and her child, you know, children were as well. And so I talked to her and she was a gift and she heard me ramble and bamble on. I was just emotionally because we were up till five o'clock in the morning. Next morning, I couldn't get on that phone fast enough to phone and, and told that, you know, that gal and she referred me and I couldn't get fast enough to the phone to talk to somebody about this because I had no clue. And my husband, he was working in Northern Alberta at the time and he saw her at the hospital and drove away to Northern Alberta, which really was hard on him and likely harder on him because he felt like he was abandoning her and yeah. us. And that was, but that was a gift when we talked and I talked to this lady and she, um, she gave me information and, and everything. But then she said to me, 
you got to take care of yourself. Well, I lost it. And believe me, I can lose it pretty fast and say what I'm thinking very quickly. Meg's likely knows that already. <laughs> but, uh, and she says, well, if you don't, you'll go down with her. Mm-hmm. And I went, I, it, it hit me hard and I hung up and she phoned me back the next day and wanted to check in with me. But I took her word seriously, and I don't know why, but I thought, boy, that was pretty straight to the point. But it was the smartest thing she did, to tell you the truth, because it really made me think. And then she talked to me. She says, are you okay after I said that to you? No, I wasn't okay, but, you know, uh, you had to say it. Yeah. Because I... The last thing I was thinking, I was taking care of myself because we had all this other stuff going on and it's overwhelming. Yeah. It's very overwhelming. So, yes. So that was that was the beginning of it all. Yeah, it's uh, I've I've used when I'm running workshops, but like I've said, you know, we work with an amazing facilitator and I say how you were told you need to take care of yourself or you'll go down with that person yeah. you're trying to support. Yeah. And, I just, I think there's so much power in that statement because it is so hard to do that, right? To put yourself first and you feel so guilty, especially if that's your spouse or one of your children. But the reality is that's what happens. If you cannot take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else, especially when you're, it's new to you and you don't know how to handle it. And there's all of those fears and emotions that go with it. Oh, very much so. And and like taking care of yourself, you have to think, well, what's taking care of yourself because you're used to just going and and I had to learn just to even have my moment to to myself and sometimes I well I cried there was times I cried there was times I was frustrated and I just vented to myself in so many ways just to let it out and Mm. I journaled and it was things that I did to try and help myself to process this and to figure out what we had to do And the hardest part was, and where the gap is in the system, and and it's getting a little better, but there's still a big gap, is they take care. And I have to say, my daughter was had the best medical help, and and she does to this day, and very grateful for that. But we didn't, as a family, have the tools. Now, where we we were ahead of the game just a little bit was this lady explained bipolar to us and her saying, take care of yourself. But there was much more to learn, but at least that was something. And that educated us about bipolar and that we did have a journey ahead of us as well as herself. And that's where, but we had to learn tools like, uh, there was two things that got us on the right track. My husband up north working and, you know, very emotional about it. Our other three kids were nervous to even go up to the hospital unless I was with them. So I went up frequently every day to visit her. And every day she blamed me for everything that was wrong with her. That went on for 10 days. Now, um, I am known to have patience, but my patience ran out. And it is short in most cases, but I kept it. And, but this one day I went home and I just, I was there very frustrated and said, what do I need to do to make this work? I just was having that. And then the kids came over, we talked and I talked to my husband and everything else. And I decided that something had to change because it wasn't where, and I was tiptoeing. I was nervous to say anything to her because if I did, poof, we up go our, 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 you know, conflict between us. All of those things were happening, and she, I said to her, I went back up and the finally on the tenth day, I went up and I decided, okay, we're going to change something. So I did, and I walked in and she started blaming. I said, stop, no more blaming. Yes, I didn't do everything perfectly far from it I've likely got to make things change myself but right now blaming is not going to work and I'm not going to listen to it anymore and I said if you decide you want to blame me today I'm going home 
I'll come back the next day to check to see if you're going to start again, because if you do, it'll be two days. And I was serious. I follow through with my boundaries and she knew it. And so when I went back and uh, we got going and she didn't blame and everything else, but she was frustrated. Well, then she set a boundary with me is because her frustration I was trying to fix. I was saying, well, you need to do this and you have to do that. And, uh, you know, the mother's supposed to have everything fixed and make it work and everything. And she says, mom, stop. You're not listening. And you're quit telling me what to do and help me problem solve. And I, I sat back and I thought, I thought I was listening. I wasn't listening. I was telling her what to do and she was getting tired of being told first doctors are telling her what to do. There's nurses telling her what to do. Now the family comes in and starts telling her what to do. How do you feel? You feel like you don't have any control of your life and everything else. So it made me stop in my tracks. And that's where I thought, okay, how do I listen better? And I didn't know what to do. So that was the trial and error that we went through Megs is learning these tools, how to listen. And I started reading books. I started checking out what I could do different and and started that way one little step at a time. But we made a lot of errors, but there was nothing. I even asked the psychiatrist at that time, is there any place I can go for us as a family to learn something, how to approach these things? Well, there was a group, but they just sat and told stories over and over again. And well, I was, I don't mind the stories, but I sure would like some tools to know how to use them and to improve these situations. And I did go and talk to a group with individuals living with mental illness. And I asked if I could go to a session and ask them what would be helpful and help this mother out that was feeling helpless at this time. And I can't tell you what I remember. I really don't know. But listening must have become more stronger from them because I started to realize that I needed to listen, reflect back what she said, and try and understand where she was at. And I started that little bit. And that's what started the process as well. So like I say, it was a lot of trial and error, Megs. You went so, right into one of the questions I was going to ask, which was kind of how do you support um, someone as they're going through a diagnosis? And I think, you know, the main things that I'm pulling from what you just said are um, it's not just the person that needs to figure out some of those tools. We all need to work on, you know, how how we um, contribute or don't contribute to that relationship um, and boundaries and communication. And I love how when you were able to set a boundary and, you know, respectfully communicate that, that she was like, okay, I can do this too. And this is going to be helpful. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. And it was like that, the boundaries and the listening and the listening was something that I started to shut my mouth and really listen to what she was saying, because and I've said this in sessions that I do, and I said, if you really listen, they're telling you how to help them. But we're so busy trying to swoop in and save them and be the hero, which we're not. And so I stopped and she says, I'm so frustrated with nobody listening to me and everything else. And I said, so you're frustrated. What is it that would be better that we could do? And she said, well, just hear me just, you know, like that I'm frustrated and I just need to vent. And she didn't need us to sit and fix her. It was to vent and what could we change? And that's what we had to work on between her and I, especially because it was affecting the whole family. The whole family is affected with this. And I want to stress it because they were running out the front and back door to get away from our conflict. Mm -hmm. And that is not good at all. And so that listening, and I started learning how to listen. So if I understand right, you're very frustrated because nobody takes the time to listen to you. And maybe 
it you need something else to help you through this yes that's it and i thought oh gosh we're on a we're on a roll here and and then there were days that she was having a rough day and there was lots of times i didn't say a lot because i felt i was likely going to contribute but what i learned was when she was having a good day she was more talkative and I bravely asked two questions one day. I said, tell me what we're doing right so far. She said, well, you're better at listening and then whatever else. But that was one of the things. I said, what could we do better? And she says, quit giving me a lot of ideas. Lots of times when I need to vent, it's just a vent. I don't want somebody telling me what I should do. I just want to get it out of my system. And I said, so would you be open to some ideas for you to consider? Or do you just want us to listen? Well, I'd be open to ideas. But, and I said, yeah, it's your choice. It's your choice. So what that was doing was giving her some control back because she didn't feel very confident or in control, which you can, I don't Imagine when you're you're struck with something that's taken something away from you and you're trying to figure out how to regain yourself, it's very difficult. So yeah. that's where it started to start changing and and we became very good advocates for her as well. Right. That's so important. And I think it's, I mean, just the reality of the systems that we have, it's needed. You need you need to be advocating for that person or for yourself to go through. The, the system to get help to whatever piece of that there is. Yeah. And the piece of advocating that we could do was be there for her as a support. And there was one time and one of my other daughters is a nurse as well. And she had an episode. She had several episodes uh, after this back and forth trying to get medication. Then she was pregnant. So that threw things uh, out of whack again, because then they really had to monitor what medications she could take. And there's certain ones she couldn't. And so, and she couldn't keep them down. She was throwing them up. And so it was really causing a lot of uh, these episodes happening. So she ended up in the hospital and we went, her husband said, could I go and my other daughter go? And we went. And so we were sitting with her and a nurse came along and said, here, take your medication. And Candace says, what is it? Well, it's your medication that you need to take and so forth. And I just sat quietly and so did my other daughter just so that she could see if she could handle it because I didn't want it. We just didn't want to rush in to save her. It was, and she, and she was a nurse herself. So she knows and and but wouldn't listen to her so i turned to the nurse and said listen she's asked what is the medication and i says i want you to know something she's a nurse she's done the research before she even got pregnant and she likely knows a lot of the stuff and all i'm asking and she's asking is go back to your book and say what the medication is and come and tell her so that she knows because she knows what she needs to take that works the sit for the safety of her child and everything else and that's when it got rectified right there and it was that advocating that helped and that's where some of the things was happening and in our family, and this is something I want to mention, Megs, is families do, everyone in a family dynamics has strengths. There is a certain strength that each one has. I was fortunate, I, I don't know why, but I had the strength to go into the crisis and then deal with it and then come out of it and likely collapse and cry and do all my stuff. But uh, I can handle it at the time. But my other children had the same strength. And the one daughter was a nurse, so that was a benefit or going through for a nurse. But there was another one of the daughters. She didn't know how to help her. And she's a nurturer like her dad. So she had a little puppy. So she wrapped the puppy in her coat, walked up to the hospital, walked into the hospital, took 
It went straight to Candace's room and gave her the puppy to hug. And that was her way to help. It was nurturing. And that's what her heart is. She's a very strong nurturer. And that was one way. And I don't know how she got away with it, but she snuck it in and they had their pet and away they went. But that that just helped, you know, for her to know that she could do something. And my son was very good at finding it first because she was very mad at us. Uh, Candace was very angry at us when we put her in the hospital and took her and she got it admitted in and she told my son uh that he uh there was this teacher that she really really respected in school and would want to talk to him because he would understand what she was going through and so he came home and told us and i said oh we'll call him and we did call him and i said would you go up and talk to her i says she is not talking to us at this point and he says, I'd be glad to. So that's something else to remember is sometimes it isn't the family members that are the ones to kind of do it unless they maybe are in that position that it is working. But it wasn't working because she was mad at us. And this teacher, he was incredible. And he explained things and helped her work through things because she wanted to get out because she felt she was fine and I knew that she wasn't fine so that was a big big help but that's where the strength is and our my husband is a nurturer and they need that especially when I'm a boundary setter and he's a nurturer yeah and so that balance was needed in both ways mm -hmm. and uh so it was it was quite interesting so strengths is important that's a and really good and i i think we don't always look out for the strengths within each other especially when you know it is a time of crisis we yeah. it's easier to focus on the crisis or focus on you know if, if someone we love is going through something just on them and not on okay how how do we work together as kind of that team dynamic to support yes it? Yeah, it, it is. And something when we reflected back after our uh, that episode that night is we are problem solvers. We've done it before. We've done it since. And but didn't recognize that we're quick problem solvers. We have our emotions after and collapse and do what we need to do and take care of ourselves or what we need to do. But it was it was something that we we recognized and it was the strengths we were going to our strengths and didn't even know it but it was something we learned mm -hmm. along the way what are you know we've kind of talked about like the high high and the low low would those be kind of the main um pieces that you would point out for someone if they're worried that someone in their circle or their family is suffering from bipolar yeah just I think I think the part is there is there the mood swings was hers mm -hmm. that if I know now right. that that's what I do know now that there was mood swings up and down the others weren't having it as much but she really was and it was something you didn't know when it was a good day and when it was uh, not as such a good day and then with the communication not good especially me uh that doesn't help any at all because she was frustrated at me because nobody was hearing her and listening to her and and she was trying to express it i i guess i guess i was slapping oh you'll get over it type of thing but it i wasn't handling it and i wasn't communicating at all well and that was was pulling our relationships and I'm a big believer and been through this ourselves as a family and doing groups relationships is at the root of the issue and if those relationships aren't working it really plays into not having the wellness I cannot stress it enough if we if I hadn't made changes in myself because I had to do the work too it wasn't just her and I'll never forget the day that she said to me, 
Mom, it's so nice to see you and the rest walk beside me instead of pointing at me as the problem. And it hit my heart pretty hard that day when she said it because that was telling us that we were working alongside of her. And there was times that she would bring up something like she was going to be the CEO of Alberta Health Services. Now, this is a tricky thing because one day we were walking and she that's meaning she's going into a little bit of a high and it's something to watch for because they're, they got big, you know, ideas and maybe bigger than what can be handled. And she asked me the question, do you think you can be the CEO, uh, she could be the CEO of Alberta Health Services? I thought about it. I stopped. I didn't answer quickly because if I said yes, could be going the wrong way. If I said no, that's going to upset her because that was one of the things is that she didn't feel listened, heard. But I said to her, you know, there's likely more to that role than you realize. And I says, you're very good at research, which she is. I, she's very good at it. I said, I would think it would take time to research what that would all mean. I wouldn't think it'd be today that would be your best day to do that. But, you know, use your strength and, and go and, and research it. That was it. And it was just, I had to stay calm, not jump in with an answer, think. I was grateful that it came to me and things like that. But that's what it takes to do that. Is there anything now that we're not in, in the mid nineties, um, <laughs> that like any places you would direct people if they, you know, have recently been diagnosed with bipolar or they have someone in their lives that have as a place to start for doing that research and learning how best to kind of walk through that? Well, there's, you know, CMHA is, is good. Uh, and they are very familiar with mental illness and, and bipolar and disorders and lots of times too. And, you know, people can reach out to me, uh, because I'm very familiar with the ups and downs and what's happening. And, and sometimes a lived experience, somebody hearing a lived experience, it resonates with them and the challenges, but they can see that they, there is hope on the other side. And I don't take, you know, I, if they're in a crisis, then we have to reach out to, you know, to, uh, you know, hospitals and different things like that to, to get the help and everything else. But there is also, you know, there's information now, especially on websites and CMHA and different places like that. And there is the helpline as well that you can go to and 811, all of those services are all in 211s are all good resources as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With the, you know, the hospital with your daughter, was it, you know, just for someone else that's watching right now, is it that fear that they're going to harm themselves? Not because not, you know, not wanting to self-harm in kind of the, the suicide way, but more just their, you know, not thinking like they're not rational in their decisions and that that could be dangerous that they're you know you mentioned she would kind of took off and you didn't know what would happen like if she mm -hmm. just you guys just let her go that that for you was like we need to get her someplace because we don't know how to help her right now that's right and safety is very important that was there was no question in our minds that she had to go to the hospital because it was a safety issue and the other things that come up with, with harming, and there was one incident, we, you know, that's when suicide did come up at one point, but she was, uh, her husband went to work, but she wasn't having a good day. And this was in the very early stages and she was wanting to harm herself. And he was very, very concerned about it. And he's, you know, he's in the medical field as well. So he was aware. So he phoned me to what I come over. And so when she wanted to harm herself and I asked her about it and, and she's, yes, I did. And I says, and I, this is me. I asked what stopped you. Mm -hmm. 
And the question, when I asked that question, she looked me in the eye and she says, I didn't want to hurt you and dad. Wow. So it it is something, and lots of times, if you're concerned, I do ask if there's suicide thoughts, you know, are you thinking of harming yourself? There was different incidents through her her journey that I had to ask those questions. Are you thinking of harming yourself? You know, do you, and if she says yes, do you have a plan? When, how, and everything. You've got to go that whole direction. And I, we phoned suicide services at CMHA at that time, but there is other suicide re uh, sources now as well and learned about suicide. Are we handling it right? And, and everything else, because again, we're learning. And that's, that's what we had to do. And it was emotional to hear what you had to do, but it was the right thing. And that's something I've had to do many times over and over again. And it, it's not putting that suicide into their head. You're asking questions because that's one thing that uh, our daughter would say is when they see the confidence in you to ask those questions, it's reassuring to them because and that's a foundation it was even when I set the boundaries with her in that early stage and when she talked at groups when when I was facilitating them she uh, I brought up that point so what about boundaries and she says well yeah well I don't like them but I know that that means my family is going to be okay so that helps her to know that that foundation is not going to collapse underneath her. Yeah. So these are very important points. Yeah. And there's, yeah, there's the Center for Suicide Prevention that is a really yes. great resource for anyone uh, out yeah. there to learn yes. more or learn how to have that conversation. Because like you said, you have to ask the questions and be direct mm -hmm. and you're going to put that idea into, into that person's head. And, you know, and you know this too, uh, Megs, is we do mental health first aid. And that's another one that I encourage families to take because it we if we'd had, had more of this information when we started back in 1995, and now today you've got the mental health first aid and you learn about all of this and the signs, the symptoms and tools and different things like that, which really, really help and make a difference. And you talk about suicide and as hard as it is, I have to do it in the sessions all the time. But just to add a little story to that and how important it is to have that talk is when I was doing groups and there was one night, there was four people that showed up. Lots of times there's a lot more than that, but this was just one night. So I just said, what's happening? And I went around the room and it came to this guy and he says, I have something to tell you. And he'd been to group several times. And he, uh, he says, I've come to say that my son, uh, my brother did die by suicide. And why I'm here to tonight to talk, uh, say this is I was so grateful that I was part of the group when you talked about suicide and understanding I did all the things that I could do, but I also realized that I, you know, I, I wasn't in control of what somebody may choose to do or do. And he says, having that conversation, he says, I miss my brother terribly. But what it is, is it relieved him of a little bit of guilt because there's, you know, you just do your due diligence. And he was great. He that's why he came back was to thank us for that. That would they he had the education because he practiced it as much as he could. And you know, unfortunately, uh, it you know the day came and it was very hard. But he wanted us to know that we were doing the right thing. Yeah, it's it's great that mental health first aid exists. And thank you for bringing it up. And I'd love to see it get to the place where. It's as common as regular first aid because it isn't just that one and done or it shouldn't be, right? There's a reason you have to keep recertifying with first aid so that you practice so that when something is going on or when you have someone in your life that's something's going on that 
you're like, okay, I know what to do because I've practiced yes. this. I didn't just do it once 10 years ago and know how to do it all of a sudden. Yes. Yes. And you don't know when you're going to meet up with it, even outside your family. I, you know, it's, it's happened to me uh, not long ago here. And it was, you know, having to work through that and help that person and get the right help for them. So it's important that you do that. Are there anything um, that you know now with kind of walking through that initial diagnosis, figuring out how to best support each other, uh, support your daughter, and then continue supporting as you know she moves forward with the learning curve of the diagnosis, figuring mm -hmm. out the medication, all of those pieces um, that you wish that you know not now <laughs> that here you know you've you've gone through all of that and you've done so much learning uh, that you wish you knew then that you could kind of share with, with anyone that's watching. I think the one thing that we really had to learn is that, that have her part of the solution, have her work through. That was the other thing that I really had to stop myself because there was situations where one day she was crying very, very hard. And, and I son-in-law asked me if I could go over and way I went. And, and I was trying very hard because I, you know, my instincts and that old fixing thing wants to slip in every once in a while, but have them part of the solution, help them think it through. And what I mean by that was that day she was crying so hard, she could barely get out what it was, but eventually I said, just take your time. And I lowered my voice. I've got a voice that projects quite well, but I lowered it and uh, slowed my pace down and said, just take a moment and tell me what it is that is the troubles. Well, she had filled out an application and she had felt she lied on it and she was bothered by this. And I said, oh, so what do you think we need to do about it? And she's, well, I don't know. I said, well, do you know who could help? I'm not sure I'm the right person to help you, but is there somebody you think could help you and, you know, just reassure you that it's okay and, or you need to change something or fix whatever. And she said, yes. And there was this gal and she said her name. And I said, so do you want me to call her or would you like to call her? And and, and she says, could you call her? She says, I can't seem to stop crying. And in this time she was trying to get, she was crying. So I called and left a message and said, could you please call Candace back? And she has something that she would need some help. And I'm wondering if you could help her. And she's asking for that. So once that was done, she settled out. Because now she was part of that process of thinking. I didn't jump in to try and fix and do all of that. And that's was one of the hardest things is to have, pull back and just ask them to be part of the solution. What do you think we can do? And they have more capacity in them and it builds their confidence up because she settled right down after that because she now had control yeah, but it, you know, got in control of the situation. She knew what to do. And if I had done any more than uh, that uh, by fixing, I, it, it wouldn't have gone well, mm -hmm. you know, it wouldn't have built her confidence. So that's one thing that I have to stress. They have more capacity than they realize. And, and we have to help them to build that confidence. In, in them that they lost in some of this well and through that you're allowing them to keep control through those situations so yeah. that in itself too right you're not escalating the feelings and the emotions because they're still holding on to control as you're helping them walk through that that's right and that's a good point is that it is to prevent that escalation and that they can be part of the process and helping that because think about yourselves when you feel not in control what do you feel like and then you got somebody rushing in to try and 
fix it and give you ideas and and you just feel like you're inept of even doing anything and and but they are capable but it's how we approach it and that is so critical it's something we have to watch because that old habit sneaks in yeah and so we have to watch it is there anything we haven't touched on so far that you would like to share before we wrap things up I think um, I think the one thing I want to stress here is I want people to realize that when things hit your house, and especially mental illness, addictions, and all those things, and they're tough. I, I know they're tough. But it's telling us to pay attention to something's not right. And it isn't always, yes, the individual that's dealing with it Yes, they need to have their care, their journey of figuring that out. But it isn't on them. And the thing is, we as individuals, I had to have a lot. I had to clean up a lot of stuff in myself. I couldn't do this work, Megs, unless I had done the work myself. I couldn't have helped my daughter if I hadn't done the work myself. And so you have to be accountable for your own self-development working through your stuff, through your journey. And when your family member sees that, that's one thing that really helps families uh, or the individual that is struggling. And they see the family making an effort and working on what they need to work on too, and it isn't just them. It makes a huge, huge difference in in the relationships and everything. because. I don't know about you, but I'm not perfect. And there was things that I needed to deal with in my life. I've had some trauma in my life in different situations that I've had to deal with. And I had to work through that. And I was that's where I was at that time when she was ill. And when this happened, I was going through stuff. And so you have this going. And I that's what made me work harder to really work through what I need. So we have to be accountable. And that's why I do the family work because the families don't get the tools. And if you don't, you do the best you can with the tools that you have. But when you find that they're not working, you need tools. And that's why I do what I do with families. They get the tools and let our loved ones give them a chance to have their journey. But you've got your journey as well. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you know, life is about learning and, and evolving and, you know, we don't, we don't get through life without challenges and without, you know, bumps and bruises and, and things to work on ourselves. And you're never, it's never going to be a negative. Doing the work yourself is never going to be a negative. Um, no. Whether that's in, you know, your family dynamic, your relationships outside of your family, how you go through your day to day. So yeah, I, I really want to echo what you just said uh, as well. And, and thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, Mona, thank you so much for joining us again. Um, time flies when we're chatting. I just love the the wisdom that you bring to it, the information, and just how you're able to, you know, talk about subjects that can be challenging, but in a way that people can connect to them and and to can learn and understand. It's always my pleasure. If it makes a difference for somebody, I'm grateful every day. Everyone for watching, thank you very much. If you're looking for more information on mental health, you can visit our website, which is domore.ag. Uh, we also have a peer-to-peer -peer support platform that you can access through our website. So if you're looking to find a place to talk to individuals who have similar experiences to you or possibly support someone because you're in a place where you can do that, please go check out Egg Talk through our website. Mona, thank you again, everyone. Take care.